Emotional intelligence, the capacity to be aware of one's emotions and the capacity to use those emotions judiciously and empathetically in relationships, as defined in the Oxford Dictionary. And you see, for years, I was fascinated by emotional intelligence and I learned the systems inside and out. And when you do that, when you start diving deeply into a certain topic, you can start looking at it from a different perspective. And what I got to notice in this shift to paradigm is that emotional intelligence can sometimes easily turn into emotional absurdity. Let me explain. To understand emotional intelligence, we need to understand emotions to begin with. You see, if we learn to be intelligent regarding a topic that we don't really understand, that's where intelligence turns into absurdity. Because if you can't actually understand what you're dealing with, regardless of your level of intelligence there, you're gonna have a hard time dealing with it. So it's like you're trying to build a rocket without really understanding the fundamentals of physics, gravity, and pressure. See, you can build the rocket, you can, you can learn the skills to build it, but guess what's gonna end up happening? And you see, that's the first problem with emotional intelligence. We learn how to notice and control emotions without actually understanding why those emotions are surfacing in the first place. To understand human emotions properly, we need to go back all the way to the evolutionary essence of our stress mechanisms. And our journey begins in the African savannas. Now let's picture the following experiment together. You're in the middle of the African savannas. And in front of you, at a distance, is a herd of antelopes. Now as you're turning to look around you, you spot a majestic apex predator. You see a cheetah lurking down in those grasslands, ready to pounce at the antelopes. Now, as soon as you turn and notice the cheetah, you will start running for your life without even thinking about it. In a split second, your brain would notice the danger. And in a split second, you'd decide whether to fight or flee. And obviously, in front of an apex predator, it wouldn't be a good idea to try and fight your way out of it. And that's why you flee. And same thing goes for the antelopes. As soon as one of them has a stressful reaction because they noticed the apex predator, it's gonna set the herd up and running for their lives. Reason being is because this is an instinctive evolutionary mechanism that we have within, which is the stress mechanism. When we're in a dangerous situation, we need to know instantly what to do. Whether we're in a situation where we can fight our way to ensure survival, or the opponent is too up in the hierarchy dominance or food chain that you need to get on running. And in this example, what triggered the stress reaction or the fight or flight reaction is the cheetah being there, right? And being being in a state where it was ready to pounce on you or on the antelopes. So there is an external trigger that stimulated this response, right? Now, when you look at it another way, you take one single antelope and you put this guy in a big field by themselves with no predators whatsoever around them. And one day, as you're observing the antelope, you notice that it got up and it started running drastically in distress. And it kept doing that over and over again. Or you're gonna see that the antelope is having a stressful reaction of some sort, but it's not really justifiable. Since first, animals don't have consciousness, so they can't use thought to trigger emotion. The only times they can trigger those, those kind of emotions, those stress mechanisms, is when there's something external that they perceive through their senses and then they react accordingly. But then in the case of an antelope, 
running around like crazy in distress without actually there being anything around that would cause this stressful reaction, the antelope would probably be sent out for cognitive evaluation because something is not right there, right? And you see, here's where it gets really interesting. Human beings are the only living species that we know of, as far as we know of, that have the ability to use thought alone to trigger a stressful reaction. And this says a lot. See, our species was blessed with the gift of consciousness, which, as far as we know again, animals don't have it. And this consciousness, this, this voice of wisdom in your head that can even observe thoughts, but this ability, as much as it's a gift, it can also be a curse. You see, you're aware of yourself, you're aware of others, and you're aware of the never-ending internal dialogue that each and every one of us have. Yet, this blessing, as I said, comes with a curse. It is a blessing to be able to control our psychology and physiology through conscious experience. However, the fast-paced socio-digital evolution is turning it into a curse. Well, how? Let's look at some data. Around 75 to 90% of doctor visits in the United States are in some way related to stress. There's 13.5 million workdays in Europe are lost yearly due to stress complaints. About 33% of people report feeling extreme stress. 77% of people would experience stress that would damage their physical health. And 73% of people would experience stress that would damage their mental health. And you see, this says a lot. Because these are the same people that you know and that I know that are going through stress management classes or emotional intelligence programs, right? And there's a thin line that people miss out on there. This gift that we have, this consciousness that allows us to use thought to interpret situations. As much as it's a blessing, it's a curse because everything can be completely fine but then you can create a stress reaction in your mind through thought alone. And before you know it, your world is falling apart and all hell is breaking loose. The main reason is that stress or this trigger of cortisol in your system actually decreases your cognitive performance. And in that case, with people suffering from chronic stress, even if we give them the tools for stress reduction, there's still a missing piece of the puzzle. See, those tools will require cognitive consistency and usage, which in case of someone suffering from chronic stress is a pretty challenging task. You see, the concept of intelligence in stress-charged situations is reactive, it's subjective, and it's emotions-based. Well, let's take a step back. Let's look at the definition of the word intelligence in the Oxford Dictionary. It is the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. Let's take an example. Have you ever been in a situation, or maybe you've seen it in a movie? Someone who's experiencing tremendous amount of stress, right? They're going through the worst day of their lives. Uh, someone is chasing them and they get to their door and they have several keys and they need to figure out which key is right. A very basic skill, if you put somebody who's calm, who's not in a stressful situation, they'll be easily able to fall through the keys, try them until they find the right one. But someone who's in, in a lot of distress, you'll see them shaking, trembling, not, not being able to do basic skills and basic mobility. Reason being is that, again, stress inhibits cognitive performance and declines the way we can process information. Now, let's add to that the fact that we as human beings have the ability to trigger stress through thought alone. What happens when you're in a stressful situation is that you get stuck in a vicious cycle because stressful thoughts lead to more stress and more stress leads to more stressful thoughts which leads to more stress and we get trapped into this vicious cycle of stress and we just can't find a way out because there's so many little problems that are making us maybe anxious agitated micro and macro emotions and we'll talk about those in a second 
But there is a big thing here, is that when we are stressed to begin with and we try to use emotional intelligence skills, keep in mind, emotional intelligence skills can be phenomenal. But if you don't understand emotions, one, if you don't understand the TFAR system, again, which we're going to talk about in a second, there's a lot that you're missing out on. There's, there's a shift in perspective that you need to acquire. And for you to do that, you need to understand certain things for you to have this, this, this different perspective and experience this shift in paradigm. So to understand our stress mechanisms better, we're looking at this ability to trigger a stressful reaction through thought alone. And yes, it is powerful, yet flawed. Well, why? Has it ever happened to you where you felt a certain way, you felt stressed, you felt angry, you felt anxious, and you tried so hard to think yourself into a different state? You tried finding common ground between stress and uncertainty, you tried not to repeat the same mistakes, same fears, or same insecurities. Yet, our conscious ability to control physiological reactions is not always the best. Because our conscious ability to control physiological reactivity, as powerful as it is, when put into the context of the socio-digital revolution we are experiencing, it becomes frail and misapprehensive. You see, just like any living creature, we are born with an emotional response system that is primarily working towards ensuring survival and thriving for procreation. The survival mechanisms we all have have allowed us to get to where we are today. However, with great power comes great responsibility. Because we start questioning the way we feel. We start questioning why we feel the way we do sometimes. Sometimes we don't like it. Sometimes we hate it. Sometimes we don't mind it. The problem is again that we're directing our conscious focus into dissecting the felt emotions. Now, take another example. Now, let's take another example here. Have you ever been in a situation where you wanted to explain your emotions or express your emotions to somebody only to realize that that was one of the most dreadful tasks you've ever been through? Yeah, you see, explaining emotions through thoughts and, and linguistic perception is not easy. Reason being is that we can't always find the right words and and the right metaphors to convey the image or to convey the message of how we truly feel. What ends up happening? People misunderstand us. We have a hard time expressing our emotions and eventually we start avoiding expressing emotions because every time we do, we end up in an awkward or discomfort or we end up in this awkward or uncomfortable situation and as human beings, we evolved to try to avoid pain and embrace pleasure. And discomfort can be linked to pain. And in that, you see a natural tendency for human beings not to want to express emotions when they don't have the full capacity to understand those emotions and then express them. Because emotions are a lot more personal than we think. Emotions are belief labels placed on events, experience, and social constructs that we experienced throughout our lives. And all that to say, it is very difficult to express our emotions consciously. We are not the best at translating how we feel into an objective physiological answer. And when we ourselves question an emotion and we can't control it, then what happens? Well, we get confused, we get stressed, and we act in disobedience uh, towards our intention. The discomfort of feeling an unwanted emotion would trigger the stress mechanism in our system and that would stimulate the primary need for survival. Then, the secondary need for avoiding pain and seeking pleasure. You see, the fight or flight reaction can be dissected into a single reaction that can be triggered based on the survival need of one of two entities. The first entity is physical, it's your body. When you are in a situation where the probability of you suffering physical damage is high, your body's natural reaction would be to trigger the stress mechanisms. Your body's natural reaction 
would be to trigger stress mechanisms in your system. Now, the other entity is not physical. What do I mean by that? This will get a bit philosophical, but bear with me. If you try a simple meditative process, oh, if you try a simple meditative process where you shut your eyes and focus on your thoughts passing by, you will notice something phenomenal. You can observe your own thoughts passing by. I'm going to say that again. You can observe your own thoughts passing by and you can try it. If you pause, close your eyes and just try to reflect on your thoughts, you will notice that there is an entity that is able to observe the thoughts and you get to decide whether to analyze and react or just lay back and observe the thoughts go by. And this says a lot. Well, what is controlling or what is this what is this part inside of us that can observe thoughts? Well, it's consciousness, and we spoke about this before. Human beings are the only species that possess consciousness, and that gives us the ability to observe our thoughts from a third perspective, per se. But in the case of emotions, we're talking about something a little bit deeper, something that is developed through consciousness, but not through consciousness alone. You see, when you're not observing those thoughts, the thoughts are you, or a construct of you. The ego, however, the fact that you can observe your thoughts means that you are not your thoughts, right? And to understand the difference with ego survival, it's pretty simple. We can trigger a stress reaction in situations where the survival of our ego is necessary. That's why arguments can escalate negatively, and most often than not, it leaves a bad residue. In a typical example where a guy is walking down the street and sees a beautiful girl, they think about talking to her or not. Now, obviously, talking to her, there's no physical harm that can happen. She's not like it's not like she's gonna take out a gun and shoot the guy in the head, but it's more internal. The guy hesitates. The reason the reason the guy hesitates is because of the stress mechanisms playing their cortisol triggers in your system, and you being in a situation where you don't actually know what to do. Should I go talk to her? Should I not? Does my hair look good? Do I look good? What am I gonna say? And all those ideas start popping in your head, and they create little micro stress reactions. And before you know it, you decide to either approach her and talk to her, or just. Run the other way. Now, whatever you do, if you went and spoke to the girl, you decided to fight this internal response. And if you decided to flee, you decided to flee from what exactly? See, those stress mechanisms were trying to protect the internal side of you that can suffer damage through the situation. Because if you go talk to a person and you get rejected or you get humiliated in some sort, there's no physical damage that took place, but your ego takes a hit. And so your ego starts using your consciousness to build those mental blocks and put you within your comfort zone. So that when you're in such a situation that you're not used to, your body and your mind, they trigger the fight or flight reaction and tell you to flee because you don't want to be put in a situation where you can risk your ego being jeopardized or the identity of who you are being taken away from you in one way or another. Now again, the ego is not you. It is the illusion that we build on a psychological level to understand who we are as people. But more on that later. Now I want you to try the exact same meditative exercise but with a little twist. Now, when I tell you what the exercise is going to be, I want you to pause this video and take a minute to try it. While in the same meditative state of observing thoughts, I want you to ask the inner observer, who are you? Now, don't think about it. The answer should be the first one that pops to your head as soon as you ask the question. Ready? See, the majority of people reported very similar answers. Whenever they asked the observer, who are you? The first gut reaction was, 
Well, I'm you, obviously. But again, it is not you. Your thoughts are not you. Your consciousness, maybe. And the reason I say that is because you can use your consciousness to observe thoughts, but you cannot use thought to observe consciousness in any way. You can't even use thought to understand consciousness as far as now. Nobody even knows where consciousness really originates in the brain or where does it come from. But as far as we know, since there is an entity that can observe the thoughts and we know that the thoughts are not you, since there is an observer that can notice thoughts, we know that thoughts aren't you. But again, consciousness, we don't know yet. A major model of self-help that became increasingly famous and often used is the model of personal affirmations. Yet again, this model comes with a big flaw. If you do not put the right emotional coherence and intensity while using the affirmations, the psychological impact of this model declines as a result. The other model that psychologists are more inclined to recommend is the questioning model. Now, why are they recommending this model? Instead of trying to consciously control the undesired inner monologue and linguistically project instead of trying to consciously control the undesired inner monologue and linguistically projecting the antonym, how about we question the monologue? How about we question the monologue to begin with? You see, questioning emotions. When you feel a certain way, if you pause and ask yourself, am I really supposed to be feeling this way? And yeah, sometimes it is okay to be feeling the way we are, but sometimes you are getting a message. You're getting an internal message that there is something wrong. And using a system where you just put that emotion aside and decide to do something else, yes, it can work, but in the long run, something is gonna happen and those emotions are gonna resurface again. And let me tell you, if it's negative emotions, it's obviously not gonna be something you'd want, right? But for us to be able to use this power of questioning, we need to understand the TFAR system. Thoughts equals feelings equals actions equals results. Thank you.